Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Novak, and today I'm talking about the Human Genome Variation Map uh, Graph Bake Off project that I've been working on. Um, but before I tell you really all about that, I want to step back a little and talk about what we're trying to achieve with this whole idea of graph genomes. Uh, then going on from that, I can talk about what we're going to have to build to make all that work, and then uh, how we should go about actually building all that stuff that we need to build. Um, so the first thing that you start with when you're designing a system is sort of what do you want to achieve with that system. Uh, so I've sort of written up a definition of what I'm trying to achieve by building these graph genomes. Uh, I want to build a genomics that works for everyone. It should be effective for all people. Uh, it should account for the differences between individuals. Uh, it should support uh, doing genomics in the space of any population that you want to look at, not only in uh, the population of the people who made the first reference genome. And it should reach conclusions that will work for everyone, that you can apply to someone regardless of their sort of demographic history. Uh, so in order to achieve that, I think that we're going to have to ditch this idea of the human reference genome. There is no such thing as a human reference genome that we can use for everyone. Any genome is going to be one point in human space. Uh, we're starting to realize that already, even with uh, GRCH38, it's got all these little red triangles all over it, which are places where they've included uh, extra sequence in addition to the sort of single sequence that they're submitting. They're also like, this is the human genome, but so is this and this and this and this. <coughs> And that's just a little bit of a confusing way to look at it. Uh, so here is just a list of the many problems uh, with the linear human reference genome. Uh, every time you see someone, you have to sort of rediscover a variant, or at least that's the way that VCF files uh, make you think. Uh, if you don't have all your variants known when you're doing the variant calling, you're going to get reference allele bias or even when you're doing the mapping, because the the, if you're mapping just to the reference genome without any variance, your reads that match the reference will map better, uh, and that can introduce a bias. Um, it's also difficult to describe variation consistently, because different people can discover it with different read alignments and sort of name it differently when, when you spit out VCFs. Uh, and structural variation is just not handled well with any of the tools that we have right now as far as I can tell. Um, so the alternative that we're moving towards is this idea of what we call the human genome variation map. Uh, we're going to replace the linear reference with an official reference graph that sort of covers all the material that's out there in the human population. Uh, in order to make this work, we need a tool chain that can actually map reads to this graph and call variants against this graph and sort of do genomics. We have to rewrite all the software that we had. Uh, and right now, we're working uh, on top of VG for that, at least in, in our project. Um, and here's a really great picture. So we don't really know how to build a reference graph that will work well. So we decided to sort of farm it out to other people who are smarter than us at Santa Cruz. Uh, so we came up with this idea of a graph bake-off, where we'd go and ask the whole community of people working on in, in this area to submit graphs to us. Um, and we would collect them and compare them. So there's all these different questions that we have to resolve, and we're testing out different people's uh, solutions to these problems. So this is sort of the structure that we put on our Bake Off uh, project. Uh, we went out and got graphs from a number of different people. Uh, we have Curiverse up there. Uh, UCSC made a bunch of graphs. Uh, there, there's a whole bunch of different submissions. Uh, and then we put them behind the GA4GH uh, graph version of the uh, server software that GA4DH has been developing. Uh, we sort of forked it off and banged on it until it supported an API adapted for graphs. Magic did a lot of that. Um, so we could put a consistent API on top of all these graphs that were generated from completely different graph pipelines 
Uh, and then we wrote a bunch of evaluations that, excuse me, did, a, did different things. We had some that sort of measured statistics about the graph, uh, some that did alignment and stuff based on VG. Uh, but those, we all wrote sort of front ends onto them so they could pull their initial graph data out of these uh, reference servers through this web API. And we used that to sort of decouple the parts of the project. Uh, the original plan was that people would not only submit graphs, but also submit evaluations. Uh, but nobody gave us any evaluations, so we wrote them all. So we got a lot of participation on the graph side, though. We had uh, 65 total graphs across all the uh, submissions and the different sort of regions that you could run your, your pipeline on. Uh, there were 10 uh, what we call approaches, like sort of different ways of, of generating the graphs, and then seven teams that submitted them. So UCSC made quite a few of these. Um, but other teams made at least one. <laughs> um, and they sort of broke them into two major groups. Uh, one is the graphs that were built from the data that we handed out as part of the project. Uh, we pulled down some regions from GRCH38 and said, OK, take these FASTA files of sequence and turn them into a graph that describes uh, all the genomes represented by these FASTAs. And so a bunch of people took on that task. But then there were other graphs that we got in or that uh, people gave us where they had a graph, but they would sort of already built it. Or they built it not from the data we gave them, but some other data that they had that they liked better. <laughs> and it turns out that that can work really well. Because when we hand out a FASTA file that's only on a seven, or I think on the biggest region, it's something like 30 different uh, sequences that we gave you, uh, versus if you go out, you can get data that represents, like for the 1,000 genomes graph, 1,000 different people. 5,000 haplotypes. Yes. <coughs> Many. More, more than 1,000. More than 30. Yeah. And so that, that can make you do better, especially since then we turn around and we do the evaluations, a lot of them using 1,000 genomes data, which well, part, partly because it, it's partly because it is a little circular. We use 1,000 genomes to build the graph, then we use the samples that you used to build the graph to test whether the graph included all the variation. Uh, but it's partly just because 1,000 genomes includes a lot of variation that wasn't necessarily represented in the haplotypes we handed out to people to build the graph from. So pulling in more data uh, can really help you there. I guess the contest is sort of a trick question. So we, did, we got a broad diversity of different kinds of graphs uh, from the submitters, uh, ranging from sort of the primary, we called it primary. It's the control graph that's just the primary reference sequence for whatever region we're talking about. Uh, here we're looking at BRCA2, which was one of the test regions. So primary is just a single sequence of 84,989 bases, and that's the graph. It's a very boring graph, but it's a graph, and if you can't beat this graph, your graph is not very good. Um, we also have one here uh, called Cactus. Uh, that's one of the submissions that UCSC produced. We have this sort of do-everything aligner pattern that uh, can build giant uh, multi multiple alignments of whole species trees, and we decided to throw it at the problem because it worked. Um, and that produces fairly nice looking graphs where you're going along, you have a SNP, you have a SNP, there's a deletion, there's a SNP. And then we had some, some more exciting submissions. Uh, this is just a De Bruyne graph of the sequences that were put in. Uh, and it turns out that De Bruyne graphs can get a little bit crazy in even simple regions. Like this is BRCA2. It's not a complicated place. Uh, but this is, I think, the K31 De Bruyne graph. So anytime it's an identical 31 mer, it merges. And it turns out that even in BRCA2, there's identical 31 mers all over the place, and they all collapse on each other. And we had some other even more exciting um, submissions that looked a little in this vein as well. 
And we also have this cool graph visualizer that Sean wrote so we could, so we could display all these, which we've called GraphViz for some reason, just to confuse you. Uh, but the URL's over there. Uh, so we went and evaluated these graphs. Uh, one of the evaluations was to map reads to the graphs and then sort of look at the mapped reads and evaluate how good the mappings were just based on how much mapping we had. So uh, among the different metrics, the ones we picked for our scatter plot were uh, the portion of reads mapped perfectly uh, into the graph with no uh, differences at all, no insertions, deletions, or edits. Uh, and then the portion of reads that were mapped uniquely. And we're using VG to do all the mapping. Um, and so you can see a lot of the graphs sort of cluster in this region. And a lot of those graphs are the graphs that we that, that use the data we gave them. So the method doesn't matter all that much when you're starting with that data. Um, but then there's, so the primary graph is down there, the graph we're trying to beat. And then we have this scrambled graph, uh, which is the primary graph plus some material representing variation. But the material representing variation has well, all been offset. So it doesn't represent real variation, it represents fake variation. Uh, so we're using that to sort of control for any effects of just having more stuff in the graph. Uh, and then our top performer here, at least on bracket two, is the 1kg graph, which is the uh, primary path. And then we've just gone and taken the 1,000 genomes VCF for GRCH38 and added all those variants. And that turns out to work really well. And for, for bracket two, which is a fairly simple graph. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's but even for MHC, it's still doing pretty well. Though in MHC, some of the graphier graphs, like Cactus or even the high K De Bruyne graph, are doing pretty well. Um, we also looked at variant calling performance. Uh, we wrote up a simple variant caller. Uh, and, well, at least on the MHC region, again, we see 1,000 Genomes is doing pretty well. Um, this is precision and recall on... NA12878, I believe, versus the uh, official platinum genomes, genotypes, uh, in the MHC region for this sample. Um, and you can see we're beating performance on just the primary reference with our pipeline, but also in this particular region, we happen to beat GATK, um, which we pulled down. I think that's the actual 1,000 genomes calls for this region is our, is our GATK um, version three of yeah. GATK. And it's also interesting that this doesn't really track read mapping performance like we might expect, especially between the different regions, because all the regions look, the read mapping looks okay. But in some of the regions that I'm not showing here because we didn't make very pretty plots of them for our paper yet, because we're not happy with the results, uh, we're not happy with the results, and the variant calling is not as good as we think it should be. And we're still sort of digging into why that is, that that could be an exciting hackathon project, is figuring out what's wrong with our variant caller in, in some of these regions. Uh, one of the really interesting things, though, that I'm not really sure that we can measure as well as I want to, um, but that we can sort of see is an effect on uh, mapping bias. So you, we can see that, <coughs> so when we go back over here, we have the portion perfectly mapped on the y-axis, and we're gaining over the primary graph when we move to like the 1,000 genomes graph. So over here, we have that gain sort of stratified by 1,000 genome superpopulation. So of the gain in mapping, which populations are getting more mapping than which other populations? And we can see that pretty much everyone is getting more mapping more than the European superpopulation, which to me means that we are reducing reference bias, assuming that we had a reference bias to the European population in the first place. Um, and so to me, that means that we're, we're sort of on the right track with this graph stuff, that we're actually improving something. Is, it, is that percent? No, no, that's... Uh Actually, proportion. Yeah, it's difference in proportion. In portion. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, we can build these. Uh, we, we think this is a feasible project to try and do this on the whole genome. We can definitely do it on regions. 
Uh, we still don't know which graph is the best, though we're getting an idea of what kinds of graphs are good. Uh, and we need to build this system as an integrated whole because some of the problems we're encountering, I think, are VG and the graphs disagreeing about what a graph should look like. So Eric's fixed up VG, so it has less opinions on what graphs should look like. So it'll be interesting to see how well that works. Right. Thank you.